EFR series ball bearing turbochargers, iron and aluminium bearing housing options. What do you need to take note of when using the aluminium bearing housing and the hardware or nut and bolt installation pack? Today, you're gonna to learn something. Welcome back. We have a great video for you. We're going to talk about the EFR Ranger turbos again, specifically relating to the aluminium bearing housing options. Now, if you buy an EFR 7163 or 7670 with the aluminium bearing housing, that turbocharger comes complete. You choose what AR turbine housing you want, and it comes installed as a complete turbocharger from the factory in a box. Job done. When you start talking about the larger frame turbos, like for example the 8474 Black Series, you can choose to buy a super core, not a complete turbo, a super core, which is, for those of you that don't know, I do have some beginners on this, uh, this channel, a super core is a complete turbocharger, less the turbine housing. That is what you call a super core. So you choose a super core with either your iron bearing housing or your aluminium bearing housing, and then you choose what turbine housing option you want free floating, externally gated, internally gated, what ARs, what boost pressure actuator, and then a hardware installation kit to suit. So if, you, if you're using an iron bearing housing, you would buy a normal hardware installation kit, which includes all of your fittings, your gaskets, your little flanges, bolts, etc., that will basically hold your bearing housing into the turbine housing, and off you go. If you've chosen an aluminum bearing housing, it's a little bit different, and that's what I want to go into today. I want to show you guys exactly what kit you need to buy. Do not just go and use normal flanges that you've got lying around in the garage or some of those small little triangular shaped uh, flanges from Borg Warner, other different turbochargers, and go and find a bolt and just screw the thing together. You will be sorry, and here's why. The aluminum bearing housing is obviously made from aluminum. Now, there's a number of reasons lightweight, better cooling, um, etc, etc. Now, when you install the aluminium bearing housing into your turbine housing, you cannot use a steel, which they're made of, flange that bolts directly onto the aluminium bearing housing surface for, for a very specific reason. Because it's aluminium, it will go through vibrations, number one, and number two, it will go through some thermal cycling. So it'll get hot and cold and hot and cold, etc, etc. Now, if you look at your flanges that you get um, that basically hold the bearing housing into the turbine housing, they are not machined, they are not surface ground to be 100% flat or true, like the bearing housing is machined on its outside surface. You will find that you'll have high spots and low spots, if you zoom in a little bit, um, which will basically cause what we term plastic deformation. So, where you have contact where there's a slight high spot or a raised section on your flange face, it will, because of the vibrations and thermal cycling, eventually start to fret and damage the aluminium, and you will lose the tension or the clamping force on your bolts. Then when you get axial or radial play between the bearing housing and the turbine housing, you, you are susceptible to have your turbine wheel make contact with its mating turbine housing along the radius profile or the exducer of the blades. You will have a catastrophic rotational failure. So this is basically a video to show you guys what's included in the actual hardware installation kit for the aluminium bearing housing models and how it goes together. Right guys, so what we have on the table here at the moment is a normal hardware install kit. Now this specific kit is what you would purchase when you purchase an iron type housing. It has V-band clamps, it's got all your gaskets, a T25, a T3, T4 twin scroll, it's got your oil outlet, uh, a flange gasket, it's got your two copper nuts that hold your V-band clamps, it's got blanking uh, uh, bungs if you want to call them with copper washers for your water in and out, and it's got an oil inlet uh, fitting as well as well as, if you can see that over there, I don't know if you can see that with the light, there's a small little plastic packet inside there with bolts and those small little flanges that basically hold your bearing housing into your turbine housing. So that is the hardware installation kit specifically related to your iron housings. Then you have something 
called a plate and bolt kit. Part number is 5900-711-9005. This is specifically related to your aluminium bearing housings and I have an 8474 black series with an aluminium bearing housing and an external free floating turbine housing T4 inlet V-band out AR105 which I'm going to now install onto this turbocharger and show you exactly how that happens. If we open this kit up you will basically see that we have I think the camera above me will show a clear picture of this. Let me move this housing out of the way and that is pretty much the contents of this plate and bolt kit. You've got five ARP bolts. Yes, guys, ARP. I'll hold this up to the camera above me so you can get a nice clear picture. I think it's a uh, hang I'll let it at a bit of an angle so you guys can see it nicely. And these are obviously forged bolts. These fasteners are cross drilled as well, so you can wire lock them. You have two stainless steel laser cut flanges. And you have what we call a load distribution plate. That's what we term it. It's got some engineering blue on it, so you can actually see where you are making contact and, contact and where you're not. And that is pretty much what the kit is made up of. Let me explain where these components go, and you'll be able to see that from there. Right, first of all, your super core. Here is your 8474 Black Series. Super core, cool. let's hold that heat shield so it stops making a noise. And what you're basically going to do is the clamping side of the bearing housing that holds the assembly into the turbine housing, put this on carefully over here, is underneath this flange face, which is basically there. You need to have a load distribution plate installed between the aluminium bearing housing, load distribution plate, and then your flange. Now, what this does is it prevents any potential high spots or irregularities in the actual flange from indenting and causing fretting between the aluminium softer material bearing housing as well uh, to the, uh, the flange. So this will basically take whatever it is that is disuniform on the flange and it'll distribute it across the bearing housing, saving the bearing housing from becoming deformed. And obviously as a result, losing your clamping force on your bolts. So this is how you install it. Pretty much like a piston ring, just twist it. So you pretty much let the, uh, the low distribution ring lie up against the bearing house, the uh, heat shield, twist it and just screw it on like you would a bolt, if I could say that, or a piston ring, if you're building an engine. Right, there is your load distribution ring. Try not to bend it, if possible. Next step would be to get your turbine housing in place. Install the rotating assembly. I always like to get the part number, which you can see on that flange over there. I'm just holding it up to the camera above me. I like to hold that get that part number and just face it upwards. I'm just particular about that. I'll just put this onto fast forward quickly. I'm just gonna take all these plastic covers off of these bolts, screw them in, and then I'll show you what the final result looks like. Right guys, so what I wanted to show you was I have one of the two flanges, the one with the three bolts already installed with three of the bolts. And there, that little dark blue colored ring you can see that sticking out over there is the load distribution plate lying on top of the bearing housing. There's the last flange which goes on top of that. I always leave the bolts a little bit loose so you can just turn until you see the little label, because that gives you the most space to then go and take your bolt. I'll just put a finger on top of it and just turn it with your free hand. That's probably the easiest way to, to get this in. There 
and once that's installed you can obviously move over to the last little bolt once again turn until the little label is facing that last section and install the last bolt now we mentioned that all of these bolts are manufactured by ARP so that means that the threads are forged that is uh, one of the selling points of ARP they're proper fasteners and uh, because they've been cross drilled obviously these bolts have been heat treated so when you wire lock them you will basically have a, a torque specification which you bolt them down with and you wire lock the two bolts together from the back to the front obviously so if one has to undo uh, or loosen should I say it would would necessarily mean that it has to, has to tighten the other bolts which prevents them from from uh, from coming loose anyway so that's pretty much how that looks you can see the load distribution plate sticking out over there and I just leave the bolts a little bit loose so you can obviously set your orientation nip one of them get it into the vehicle and obviously go from there the next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about was is the actuator so you have basically got to piece together the turbocharger that you want for your build now 8474 black series let's say for example you're building a 2j it's a popular a popular used engine six cylinder and you want to make 800 horsepower right this is a 950 horse capable turbocharger and you would obviously need to boost quite high in order to achieve your 850 or 800 horsepower and you would obviously choose whatever turbine housing you want let's say for example you've gone for the 105 externally gated setup like we've got on the table here aluminium bearing housing you've installed your um, bolt and plate kit and uh, you now want to use or choose an actuator now obviously this is this is externally gated so an actuator is not going to work here let's assume that you're using a turbine housing that has got a swing valve or internally gated you would then need to decide what boost pressure actuator you would want to use for your build now obviously because you're boosting quite high I wouldn't use anything less than the high boost actuator for that specific setup let me just get this out of here so I can stop making a noise of the plastic all right on the table we've got two different actuators one is a medium boost and one is a high boost actuator how you tell the difference from the actuators obviously there's no part numbers on them is you have a look at the little labels or the stickers and you will see that one has got a, a yellow dot on the left hand side or the right hand side if you're looking at it on the screen now and the other one's got like a blue or a gray dot the gray dots the high boost actuator and the yellow dot is the medium boost actuator if you really wanted to check it out you can also just if you didn't have a flow bench or anything that you could check with a gauge just pull on it that's a little bit easier to pull than that is so high boost low boost right guys so aluminium bearing housing you need a specific plate and bolt kit don't forget that don't neglect it you will be sorry and then obviously you can choose your boost setting on your actuator provided obviously you're using an internally gated turbine housing so medium uh, low medium or high boost obviously if you're going to be using a turbocharger that is going to be making quite a substantial amount of power you wouldn't use a low boost actuator let's say for example you only wanted to make 550 horsepower you've got a large cc engine and you didn't want to really boost much um, and it wouldn't take much to make 550 horsepower out of a 950 capable horsepower turbocharger you would use a medium boost actuator a lot of customers of ours use these nissan patrols the tb48 it's a six cylinder inline six 4.8 liter and it spools up a large turbocharger really really easily so you would not be able to even though you only want to make 550 horsepower you wouldn't be able to use say an efr 7163 which is 550 horse capable because it would over spool that turbocharger you would make all the power between 1800 and 3000 rpm and after that you'd have nothing left so you'd obviously use a big turbocharger like the 8474 black but you would use your medium boost actuator to get you to your 550 horsepower capable mark be that as it may guys i hope you guys enjoyed that video i hope you learned something today and please like and subscribe catch you guys next time